Well, it was a warm July evening, early in the evening, in early 1963, when uh, he pulled into town. He drove in cool and slow. He had a dark gray big Ford Victoria, the kind that the state troopers owned. And he pulled up in front of Martha's dinette. It was half diner, half sporting goods store to sell tennis and golf equipment. Martha ran a little rooming house upstairs, and uh, and uh, her sons ran each side of the dinette and the sporting goods store. And he got out of the car and he strode over to the to the door of the dinette. Martha was standing there behind the counter waiting for him. He had called earlier, asked if there was a room open. And uh, he had Stetson hat on, the kind that was made around here, but the kind that nobody owned. And he had uh, dark blue jeans on. And a, and a shirt, the kind they wear out west, you know, the kind with the snap buttons and the pearl inlay on them. And uh, it was like a sort of a blue shirt, a little scroll work on the shoulders, sewn in scroll work and, the, you know, double snaps on the breast pocket. And he had a belt buckle with a large belt. And it he had it engraved on a big H with a circle around it. And right under the H in small letters it said heavenly. And uh, he had, uh, you know, cowboy boots on the kind that was also made around here, but the kind that nobody wears around here either. So you knew he was from way far away. He had Wyoming plates on the Ford. They said, you know, in small letters above the plate number, it had like Wyoming, big sky country. And on the bottom engraved in small letters, it said heavenly. And, it, and the letters on the, on the license plate said John Gabe, G-A-B. And he strode with the kind of stru stru striding gait that you only seen on TV when somebody was playing a sheriff from out west. And uh, he strode in, said, good evening, ma'am. And uh, she looked at him and she was struck. And she goes, you must be John Gabriel. And he goes, yes, ma'am. I called earlier for the room. She goes, yes, here's the key, just sign in. And do you know how long you'd be staying? Well, I'm not quite sure, ma'am. Uh, could be a week or two. And she says, you come a long way? She said, yes, ma'am. And he had a kind of look on his face. It wasn't scary, but it had like, when you first saw him, it was kind of like he had to look like, you mind your business and I'll mind mine, in kind of a nice way. But he also had these piercing blue eyes and dark hair, a little gray on the side. He was about 6'3". He was slender and uh, not an ounce of fat on him. And he uh, had a look about him. It was a look of, uh, his eyes shone the look of, you know, having lived life and seen life and all the parts of life. Yet... He had this unaffected look on his face. It wasn't a beat down. It wasn't a, a look of being run, run into the wall by life. It looks like it just didn't infect him. You know, he he looked straight into your eyes, and uh, and it, and it gave you a feeling of being, you know, held up. Not held up at gunpoint, but you didn't feel afraid. And you knew right away, without even 
even him saying he was a man of his word. And he took the room and went upstairs and he dropped his suitcase off. He came down, he had a black cup of coffee at the counter. And he went out and he uh, strode up and down Main Street of Still River. And everybody turned their heads because the way he walked, that slow, cool gait, was the way he drove also. And uh, he just stuck out. He wasn't like everybody else, you know, scuttling around. And he paced off Main Street in one direction and paced it off in another. And, uh, well, he would show up for the first couple days at the Still River Diner in the morning, reading a paper and having coffee in a, in a roll. And uh, the third day he was there, you know, uh, Bob Carmiani, the mechanic, was sitting two seats over from him, talking with uh, Bob Radichowski. And uh, Bob needed his porch fixed, and uh, uh, um, he was talking to Carmignani, Bill Carmignani, about getting it fixed. He said his son could come over and do it in about two weeks, but they were going on vacation. And, and John was listening, and he looked over at him, and they looked at him, and they said, you know, Whoa, and he said, howdy, boys. And for some reason, they liked him immediately because uh, he had this funny grin on his face that was kind of, it's hard to explain. Anyway, he said, I hear you need a porch fixed. I'm looking for some temporary work, and I can, I know how to do woodwork and carpentry work. And he said, and he said well, what can you do it for? And he says, name your price. And so I'll come over tomorrow and do it. So they, they made a deal, and it's where are you from? He says, Wyoming. And uh, he says, uh, got up, he says, I'll see you eight tomorrow in the morning. And sure enough, he was there right at eight o'clock with his tools. And... Uh, he did the porch up really nice in two days, and and the price was was really really inexpensive, a lot less than uh, uh, Bill Carmignani thought he was going to have to pay. Well, you know, every day after that, they would say hi. They would meet at the diner, talk about the news and stuff. Though he never explained. Uh, what he was there for, they never wanted to pry because he had that look of, you know, you knew not to go too far with him about questioning what he was doing. And uh, one day he went out, usually he went out to the intersection where there was a cigar store, a uh, tobacco store, a convenience store. And he bought the paper, and he sat on the bench, which was the bus stop, right at the four corners of um, Main Street and the West Street and the Stilt River. And he was sitting there reading the paper. And he put the paper down, and he was just staring off into the distance. People were starting to get a little bit used to him. And... Um... Marie Michalizzi was with her one and a half year old son in a in her Ford, and she was station wagon, and she was coming down Main Street to the light, and on the left side, the city bus was coming up, and the lights malfunctioned, and both. Her and the bus had green lights, and she pulled out into the intersection to make a left turn, and the bus slammed right into her driver's door, 
and caved in the door. And she was, you could see blood dripping down her head. She was out cold. The baby was crying. And the door was jammed. And also, the engine was starting to smoke. Then a little puff came up, and you saw a little flame coming out, the big crack in the hood. John went over to his Ford, which was parked there, about two cars away. He opened the back and got this crowbar out. And he strode over in big strides. And he stuck it in the door and pried the door open. She was out, and he picked her up and took her and laid her down about 20 feet away on the, uh, the bench there, the bus stop bench. And he put a blanket from his trunk under her head. And uh, somebody else, another uh, woman, got the baby out and brought the baby over and said, I'll take her home to her mom. And the ambulance came and took her to the hospital. And uh, while they were loading the ambulance, the tow truck was just pulling up for the car. And it burst into flames, the whole hood in front. And the news went out that uh, this fellow, the stranger, saved her life. And, uh, you know, a reporter for the local paper came out. And he was wondering who this, and people were talking, what happened, and he took the report, and the police took the report, because John left after he laid her down, and uh, he uh, went back to Martha's, and I went upstairs and packed his suitcase, got in his Ford, and left town. And the police were trying to find out who he was. The paper was trying to find out who he was. And he left. And they talked to Martha, and she did have his name. And he put his home address. It was uh, 777 uh, Heaven's Gate Ranch, Paradise, Wyoming. So the, the police called, and the sheriff said that he went out there, and there's nothing there but open prairie. And uh, so never heard from John again. And uh, you never know.